Well, lovely. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And what I was asked to do was to give some reflections and future directions, given my experience of the recovery trial over the past 18 months or so. And I thought I'd start by making some general observations and give you some background of where I was um, in January, February of 2020, before I'd ever thought about uh, uh, the recovery trial or even really thought much about COVID. And I think some you know, truisms really that reliable evidence from clinical trials is essentially essential for making appropriate decisions about how we treat patients, which, which treatments are beneficial, which are harmful, and what's the combination. And of course, actually in medicine, we're confronted all the time with the trouble of having to make decisions in the absence of reliable evidence. Now, sometimes that's because the trials have never been, never been done, um, or often it's because those that were done were poorly designed, weren't conducted well, poorly analyzed, poorly reported. So the absence of reliable evidence from clinical trials may in fact harm individual patients and public health. And clinical trials have been in the spotlight over the last few years, uh, in particular because of uh, the challenges, rising cost and complexity. So two recent trials of uh, cholesterol lowering injections, PCSK9 inhibitors for cardiovascular disease cost uh, over $1 billion each. 85% of commercial trials uh, have reportedly failed to recruit on time and to target. And as a consequence, there's a time to uh, abandon randomization for the lure of observational methods. Um, I, if I could characterize that as saying, uh, it, it, it's easier to get an answer. The problem is you never know whether you've got the right answer. And that's also distorted treatment priorities Early decisions to uh, continue or not contribute continued uh, drug development were based on limited data. Uh, there's been a switch away from preventative and, and long-term treatments for common diseases, and often a focus on very expensive drugs for rare conditions. And those are important, but in public health terms, um, the lack of evidence uh, for common conditions is a, is a real challenge. And if you want some illustration of that, what we can see is that um, between 2000 and 2015, uh, the revenue for the top 10 selling drugs in the United States uh, went up two and a half fold, but the potential patients who could be treated with one of these treatments was substantially reduced, about seven and a half fold. So overall, there's nearly a 19 fold cost uh, increase in cost per patient. As I say, away from treatments for common diseases such as diabetes uh, and depression, uh, and uh, onto uh, diseases uh, which are uh, either subtypes of cancer or rarer diseases. And so together with colleagues, uh, Rory Collins, Louise Bowman, Richard Pito, uh, in January, February last year, we had this uh, paper published in the New England Journal talking about the magic of randomization and really emphasizing what was needed uh, in order to solve some of this crisis. And I could summarize it on this slide, smart design and delivery, integration with routine healthcare and the data systems that are there, supported by proportionate trial regulations and guidance, and consequently delivering a benefit for patient care and public health. And I'll touch on some of these points as I go through the talk. But now let's go, go through to um, uh, early March uh, last year, uh, as COVID uh, was uh, hitting uh, Northern Italy, and as uh, it was likely and imminently going to hit uh, the UK really very hard. And of course, we then had an unprecedented clinical challenge. We could, could anticipate and indeed got an overstretched health system. We had huge pressures on uh, personnel, huge personal stress for frontline medical staff, and very, very large numbers of unwell, anxious, elderly, and always alone patients. And even in that context, a context in which we have a common disease which for patients admitted to, to, to hospital, sadly, one in four of those patients did not survive the hospital admission. The patients on ventilators, it, the picture's even worse, and huge uncertainty about which treatments. Many candidate drugs, many opinions from many sources, some of them medically qualified, some of them definitely not, um, and frankly, no reliable data, uncontrolled case series, small uh, laboratory and um, preclinical experiments, inconclusive randomized trials. And in those circumstances, large scale randomization really is going to be necessary to sort out uh, what actually works from what we hope might work. And so in order to plan the recovery trial, it was helpful to look back, look back to the 1980s, when of course acute myocardial infarction 
was somewhat similar to COVID, a common disease with a high mortality for those patients who admitted to hospital and no clear uh, evidence of, of good treatments. And Salim Youssef, Rory Collins, Richard Pito, I recognize a couple of those names already, uh, produced this paper on why we, why we need some large, simple randomized trials. They didn't say that every trial should be large and simple. They made the point that we needed some large uh, trials that would actually uh, assess the effects of treatment on mortality of widely practical treat treatments for common conditions. And if you read that paper and you sort of half close your eyes and you replace the word myocardial infarction or cardiovascular disease with coronavirus or COVID, it's remarkable how much more slots into place. And so perhaps the most famous trial from back then, and perhaps the trial, well, it is the trial that made me first interested in just the science that goes behind trials, uh, was the ISIS-2 trial of streptokinase and aspirin. Famously, a one-page case report form, a clear outcome focusing on five-week mortality, and a factorial uh, randomization, you could call it a platform trial almost, uh, a factorial randomization of aspirin versus not and streptokinase versus not, and demonstrated a really significant reduction in mortality. Each treatment on its own, a modest effect combined, that turns into really quite a big effect. But I had the protocol for the ISIS-2 trial on my desk as I was writing the protocol for uh, the recovery trial on the 9th of March, 2020. And on the front page, it said, by far the most important determinant of the success of the trial is the extent to which the responsible physicians and nurses choose to enter their patients. Hence, the extra work must be and is absolutely minimal. And that was a key part of the philosophy as we designed the recovery trial. The trial has to be doable. Anybody can design a complicated trial. The question is, uh, how do you design a trial which has the essential features and which can actually be done, and in this particular case, in the extreme circumstances of a pandemic? So we had simple eligibility criteria. We didn't know how to treat any patients who were hospitalized with coronavirus, so they were all eligible. An important outcome, mortality, and then secondary outcomes of ventilation and duration of hospitalization. Randomization, of course, because we uh, need to really understand uh, the causality. And follow-up with a one-page case report form and extensive linkage to routine NHS data sets. And when I say extensive linkage, it's around 25 different data, data sets national data sets, typically with coded data, uh, many of which had not been used for this sort of clinical trial research before, but which provide uh, extensive and comprehensive follow-up. Uh, it's difficult to be lost to follow-up um, uh, when this sort of data is available. The design, as I say, was simple. We started off with a, uh, a parallel um, uh, group randomization where patients could be randomized to one of several active treatments, the Pinavir HIV treatment, dexamethasone, a steroid, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin versus no additional treatment. Now, what's interesting that is each of those treatments, people had strong views about whether they should or shouldn't be used, but there was frankly no evidence for any of them. Over time, uh, we were able to introduce a factorial design. So going back to that ISIS-2 example, um, for example, adding in colchicine, studying convalescent plasma and the monoclonal antibodies and studying aspirin. So one can get multiple answers simultaneously within the same uh, uh, study. And most recently, with this, this is the sort of current randomization structure uh, where we have dimethyl fumarate as a, as a phase two study, baricitinib, higher dose dexamethasone in some centers and empagliflozin. I'll talk more about that later. So as I say, this, the idea was that this study would be open to everybody. Um, and that it needed to be simple. And so every acute hospital in the country takes part. It becomes, if you like, part of the day job or indeed night job of being a frontline uh, doctor admitting patients with COVID. You know which patients will need oxygen. There'll be some patients who need their diabetes treated. But at this stage, there was no knowledge about how we should treat their COVID. They could, we could, but they had the option of using treatments in an arbitrary fashion, which of course is what happened in many parts of the world or randomizing and actually learning which treatments worked. So as I say, uh, 180 or uh, something hospitals in total, every part, every acute trust in the entire country, uh, some centers bigger than others, um, but really very rapid recruitment, such that by uh, 100 days, we already had 12,000 patients randomized. And of course, over last winter, um, I think our fastest rate of recruitment was 1,000 patients in 30 hours. 
And what were the results? Well, the first thing to highlight is that there are a number of drugs that everybody expected might, would work. And some people said were miracle treatments or, you know, um, and, and were often in, in recommendations, which turned out to be, um, have no uh, clinically meaningful effect. Hydroxychloroquine on the top left, no meaningful effect. Lapinavir bottom left, no meaningful effect. Those treatments were effectively first and uh, second choice in many national guidelines around the world. They're useless in this in this context. Azithromycin, many people would, were very keen on using azithromycin, an antibiotic, of course, but thought to have some anti-inflammatory and possibly even antiviral properties, no effect. Convalescent plasma used by over half a million people in the United States. There was a 100,000 patient uh, observational study because apparently it was too hard to randomize. Um, and yet, actually, when you do the randomized trial in about 9,000 patients, you find no meaningful effect. Aspirin and colchicine uh, had their advocates um, uh, cheap and, and yeah, potentially widely uh, useful, uh, widely available treatments, but again, sadly, no, no meaningful benefit. But the breakthrough really came on the 16th of June on 2020, when we identified and were able to announce at lunchtime uh, that uh, dexamethasone, a cheap, widely available steroid drug, uh, reduce the risk of mortality in patients with COVID. For patients on a ventilator, reduce mortality by a third, for patients on oxygen by about a fifth, but it had no meaningful effect uh, uh, amongst patients who were not, who, whose respiratory function was not sufficiently severe um, uh, uh, to, to require oxygen. So if you like, there's an overall clear benefit, but actually you can call this precision medicine if you like, we, what we actually see is that the benefits are seen in those people who, um, where the disease has progressed to the point that the infl there's uh, substantial inflammation uh, leading to respiratory compromise. We wouldn't know that if we hadn't studied the broad range of patients we included. It's also worth reflecting that this is a treatment that many people thought was dangerous. In fact, some people wrote to the MHRA and said you should not be studying or allowing the study of steroids because suppressing the immune system in people fighting infection, in infection is so obviously dangerous. Well, that result was allowed, announced at lunchtime. Um, uh, by tea time, uh, the chief medical officers and uh, the medical director of the NHS England wrote to every hospital in the country saying, normally we would advise for the full paper. However, given this clear mortality advantage with good significance and a well-known medicine, which is safe under these circumstances, we consider it reasonable for practice to change in advance of the final paper. So here's a result that was um, uh, announced at lunchtime, was policy by tea time and was very definitely saving lives by the, by the weekend. And that's subsequently been adopted all around the world um, uh, uh, in, into uh, uh, national and international guidelines, including by the WHO and in the United States, and has, is estimated to have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Some people have put that estimate at a million lives. I think that might be a bit excessive, uh, but it's certainly uh, hundreds of thousands of lives from a simple treatment, which was sitting in our pharmacies all the time, but we didn't know it worked until we did the trial. Um, uh, and that is why the trial was so important. So I'm gonna switch from there to a slightly different uh, scenario. Uh, I'm gonna switch now to tocilizumab. Now, tocilizumab, as people will know, is an uh, interleukin-6 antagonist, typically used for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but also sometimes used in the context of CAR-T therapy. And there had been uh, a number of uh, people advocating for its use in the uh, outbreak of COVID in northern Italy in February 2020. Huge quantities of tocilizumab were used, apparently to the extent that they were actually running out of drug even for those people with rheumatoid who, would, who we knew would benefit from it. But at the end of the epidemic or, or that phase of the epidemic in Northern Italy, nobody was any the wiser as to whether that huge uh, tocilizumab use had in fact uh, been beneficial or not. And there were strong people, strong arguments I remember of people saying, well, targeting you know, one uh, interleukin is not enough because this is a more comp the immune system is more complicated than that with plenty of redundancy and other people who said well you know really we've got to target it you, and use a 
a proper immune, immune modulatory drug that will really uh, suppress uh, the, the response. So if we look at the evidence uh, as it accrued during the course of last year, um, what we find is the problem of uh, multiple small randomized trials producing no clear evidence of whether this treatment works or not. So for example, Covactor and Impactor are two trials run by Roche who, who um, uh, hold the license uh, for tocilizumab. And if one looks at the impact of this treatment on all cause mortality, it doesn't look all that impressive. The remap cap trial, of course, was, was much larger, uh, but it still only included um, uh, fewer than a thousand patients and, few, and only about 200 or so uh, deaths. And yes, they saw a benefit, but the confidence interval is wide. And it leaves this question of, was this a, a chance um, uh, positive result? There's no heterogeneity across these results on this screen. Or uh, was it because the patients were exactly the right patients to treat? And, and these are patients who are on critical care, which is actually quite a difficult thing to, to define, and who were within their first few hours of getting into critical care which again is a sort of movable feast given you know, the availability, getting onto critical care will depend not only on the patient state, but the availability of critical care beds. So was this because it was a chance finding? Was this because they selected the patients um, uh, very carefully? Or was this actually the truth um, and could be more generalized to a wider group of patients, including perhaps people who are not on a ventilator yet, and therefore there might be a bigger, uh, bigger benefit? Sorry. And so we did the, um, uh, uh, the we included tocilizumab for patients who were hypoxic and who had inflammation, a CRP over 75 in recovery, and randomized 4,000 patients. Mortality in this group of patients is high. Well, that's what you'd expect. In the usual care group, about a third of patients uh, would uh, um, sadly died. And what you can see is that there was a significant reduction of about 14, 14 or 15% in the risk of all cause mortality. And that what we could also see that this, is, this result was consistent uh, across the different groups of patients in older and younger patients, in men and women, it's consistent regardless of ethnicity, days since symptom onset, uh, whether patients were uh, on invasive mechanical ventilation, non-invasive uh, ventilator support, or just simple oxygen with no ventilator support at all. And in fact, I don't, haven't shown this on here, but we also saw that there were benefits in terms of reducing the risk of needing to go on to a ventilator, um, uh, which are clearly very important. And what we saw was that the results were additional to the use of steroids. So having demonstrated the benefits of corticosteroids, um, uh, really nobody from that point onwards um, uh, was untreated with steroids uh, and we got clear results on top of steroids. And so now if you look at the evidence and um, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, the impact of tocilizumab on the all-cause mortality after the recovery trial, I've shown you the top part of the figure, that's exactly the same as it was before. Now I show you the recovery results and then you combine all trials together. There is a clear, modest, it's not substantial, but modest benefit and a reduction in the risk of mortality. And in, in rough terms, uh, for every 100 patients you you treat with tocilizumab, you may save three lives. Of course, there are other benefits beyond that. So I really want to use this as an example that actually we need not only randomization, but we need large scale randomization if we're going to pick up these sorts of benefits, which do actually matter and do become practice, do change practice. And then finally, in terms of results, um, I wanted to talk about the Regenerons um, a monoclonal neutralizing antibody combination. Um, in the uh, pre-hospital setting, this was given MHRA approval um, in mid-August, um, but in recovery, we focused on whether this treatment uh, would reduce the risk of death uh, among patients who had been hospitalized. And what we see is, um, the first thing to say is we pre-specified that we would be particularly interested in those patients who were seronegative at the point of randomization. So to be clear, these are patients who get admitted to hospital, who have COVID confirmed on a, on a diagnostic test, but who have not mounted antibody response of their own. 
And when you look in that group of patients, you see a very clear reduction in the risk of death. When you look at, you see an improvement in your chance, in the chances of getting discharged alive from hospital and a reduction in the composite endpoint of invasive mechanical ventilation or death among those people who are not on a ventilator to start with. And again, the results within the seronegative group are completely consistent regardless of days in days in symptom onset, um, age and so on and so forth. So here we have clear evidence of a treatment that is beneficial in, if you like, a subgroup of patients who've been admitted to hospital. Now, why did we uh, study all of these patients? Well, we didn't know whether this treatment would work at all in anybody. And we didn't know whether this treatment might work a little bit in those people who are seropositive or not at all. It turns out that essentially it, does, it works not at all in those people who have already mounted their own antibody response. So again, here we, what we have is we can now come up with, if you like, a precision medicine um, uh, uh, strategy for patients with COVID who are admitted to hospital who don't have, haven't raised antibodies of their own, giving them antibody combination is effective. But we can only get there by having done the large scale randomization uh, in order to demonstrate that. So on the back of recovery, we now have um, three treatments that we now know work and we know reduce uh, the risk of dying. Dexamethasone for patients who are hypoxic, tocilizumab for patients who are hypoxic and at least in the context of a general uh, um, recovery uh, who are inflamed and the Regeneron combination of monoclonal neutralizing antibodies uh, for those patients who are hospitalized and are seronegative. And we also know that there are half a dozen treatments that people thought would work for good and uh, not so good reasons, um, but in turn, in, in reality, turn out to have no meaningful effect on mortality or indeed on the other endpoints that, we, that we've studied. Now that result is really important because uh, the, that uh, avoids having to waste resource. Let's think about it not only in terms of manufacturing and supplies and money, but yeah, pharmacy time and doctor's time and so on and so forth. And it avoids exposing patients to treatments that are going to give them no benefit and therefore on balance are bound to be, be, to be uh, rather more harmful. And then also um, a, a avoids making a false promise to those patients. So I want to think to take this next stage of the talk and sort of reflect on um, some of the key lessons and, uh, how, and, and what we might need to take forward. So the first is to think about um, some of those key lessons and, and rather than me summarize it, I turn to this um, uh, um, uh, uh, editorial uh, from or opinion piece from the New York Times written by Zeke Emanuel, who's a, uh, a professor at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it, gave, it was given a provocative title, which was definitely not my, my choice, and I suspect probably wasn't uh, his either. Where is America's groundbreaking COVID-19 research? The US could learn a lot from Britain. Well, let's leave that aside for, for, for the moment and let's focus on what, what the observations that were being made about what made recovery successful. The first, it was designed to be easy to take part in. It's easy to design a trial that's difficult to take part in. It was designed to be easy to take part in. Secondly, it was quickly approved. We went from me writing the, uh, the protocol with Peter Horby on the 9th and 10th of March to the first patient randomized on the 19th of March. So nine or 10 days, having been through all the relevant uh, uh, approvals. And it was adopted across all hospitals in Britain, every single acute hospital. If you've got COVID and you go into a hospital, uh, the recovery trial is open for you. We have uh, the, the uh, advantage in the UK of National Health Service data. Uh, the NHS data is not simple, it's not unified, it's not, if you like, deep and detailed, at least uh, not on a national scale, but it is there and it can be used to substantially simplify the research process, reduce the burden on frontline medical staff, and in, indeed to ensure that you get better quality results because essentially you can't have lost a follow up. It was supported by leaders in government health and healthcare, which I think was absolutely critical. The chief medical officers, for example, saying that hydroxychloroquine was not to be used arbitrarily, but only in the context of a trial was really uh, a very important statement when there was a lot of pressure to the contrary. We have a national system of research nurses, the clinical research network run by NIHR, uh, who could be redeployed. 
And I think perhaps the most critical, it was incorporated as part of everyday clinical care in hospitals. When a patient gets admitted to hospital, they can be prescribed a drug or they can be randomized. You try to make the two of those things uh, um, uh, as, as uh, like for like as you can without increasing burden. And that has, been, that has been key. And again, the chief medical officers wrote to hospitals saying this is to be considered part of routine care. And how did that transpire? Well, here's a snapshot of data. This is English data, just because I, ha I happen to uh, have it uh, for a, a couple of months last autumn, but the pattern's pretty similar um, throughout the last 18 months. Um, in blue bars is the number of patients admitted uh, at each hospital. In orange dots is the proportion of those admitted uh, who were enrolled in the study. And you can see on average it's about 10%, but there's some really quite large uh, and busy studies, uh, um, centers, hospitals, who were able to recruit 25% of all their patients into the, into the trial. And actually, if you look, and you have to look back on my slide, what you can see is that much of this recruitment is in, um, not in big academic medical centers, some is, but not, a lot of it is also in district general hospitals in towns and cities up, up and down the country in places that one wouldn't ex normally expect. So in um, uh, Hartlepool and in uh, Chester and uh, Medway in Kent, um, uh, in Swindon, uh, you know, there, there are a number of places which would not be on the typical uh, roadmap or, or, of, of where should we start our clinical trials. But let's face it, that's where the patients are. That's where the questions are. And by generating the data in this way, you produce data that are actually not only clear and compelling, but they're relevant back to that, back to that population. So what did it feel like for the clinicians on the ground? Well, here are three quotes. And on the left, coming in, this is from last summer or so, coming into work each day, people would say to me, they've chosen the wrong drugs. Like lots of people said that to me. Um, uh, and I'd say, let's see. I didn't know that this drug it turned out to be dexamethasone would work. No one knew which drugs would work. But I thought, this is a, a DGH consultant talking, I thought we should help find out. Three months on from the start of the trial, we have a therapy which is cheap and readily available. Millions could benefit. I'm glad we helped contribute 1% of the data. Thank you to the patients, absolutely. So you know, here is a, a, a clinician who is seeing this as a part of how, they, how we work out what a better future looks like, how to treat our patients better, given the lack of knowledge at present. On the top right, the recovery trial has inspired many of the more junior doctors in our trust to look again at the career in research. Well, as a, a, an academic clinician, that sounds great, but I actually think the second part of the sentence is more important. We feel that this has given an opportunity and access to treatments to our patients that they would not otherwise not have had. So I think you, what we're seeing is that there's uh, very clear support on the ground, and that's certainly what we've heard um, both formally and informally, for being involved in finding the answers. And that means being involved in the clinical trials. And that means the clinical trials have to be designed in a way that people can be involved in, not in a way that exclude people, um, both doctors and hospitals and patients, um, uh, unnecessarily or in, even inadvertently. And talking of patients, one of the key uh, strategies we, or strategic decisions we took right at the beginning was one around transparency. And so everything that I've shown you pretty much, um, uh, all the um, results, the daily recruitment, uh, the, uh, every approval, uh, every submission to ethics uh, committee, all the training materials, you name it, it is all available on our public website. You can see I've taken this snapshot from a, a little while ago, I think this one must have been from about October, we're now up to 42,000 patients randomized. But everything is available online uh, so that uh, it, whether you're a doctor uh, or a research nurse or a pharmacist uh, involved in the study or uh, a patient or a patient relative interested in, in the study or from media or from politics, from this country or from around the world, the information is there and it's available. I've never understood why people consider protocols to be confidential in some way. If you're expecting patients to take part in your trial, uh, then it's, it seems entirely um, uh, uh, reasonable uh, to uh, make the protocol available so people can actually understand uh, what, is, what is being done. So what next for recovery? Well, uh, we, 
we continue evaluating of potential treatments for COVID-19 just at present. Uh, we're we randomizing uh, patients to baricitinib or not. We've got several thousand patients in that comparison already. To empagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, and then in uh, our overseas centers to higher dose dexamethasone, uh, and then um, as a uh, phase two trial, uh, di dimethyl fumarate um, uh, as, a, as, a, as I say, as a phase two trial. The second thing we have been doing is international expansion and capacity building. So we now have patients in uh, nearly 500 patients in Nepal, nearly 200 patients in Indonesia. Vietnam is just starting and there are about another half dozen countries which we're working with and, and will be um, uh, starting up over the coming uh, uh, couple, of, uh, couple of months. And that is both because, of course, the virus moves around the planet um, uh, and also uh, because it helps us to build the capacity for future pandemics. And then finally, we're uh, working on the a potential extension to extend uh, the recovery trial to other respiratory viral pathogens. And as we look ahead to this, this winter, it seems very likely that a large number of people are going to come into hospital with an acute respiratory uh, viral infection. Um, for some of those people, it will be COVID. For some of those people, it will be influenza. For some people, it will be both. And uh, there is as many clinical uncertainties about how we should treat seasonal influenza as there are for COVID. So I want to finish my uh, uh, talk by really talking, uh, going back to the beginning about what we need to reinvent randomized trials. I think I've emphasized the sort of smart design and delivery. Um, uh, I've emphasized the integration with routine healthcare and with data. But what I want now want to focus on is the need, the need and it, this is absolutely critical need for proportionate trial regulations and guidance. Um, uh, and uh, in order we, to get the benefits for patient care and public health. Like I said at the beginning, medicine practiced in the absence of evidence is not a good deal for patients or for the health system. And so I wanna pick out a few examples of work that's been going on and discussions have been going on over the last uh, three or four months, I guess, um, about uh, focusing on the future. And the first is to think about the G7, which of course the UK has been has been chairing for the, for this past uh, uh, or for the, for this year, which produced a therapeutics and vaccines clinical trial charter uh, under the uh, health track uh, of the G7 conference uh, in June. And I've picked out a few highlights. It's not a very long document. I think it's only two pages. So this is quite a substantial proportion of, of what's in there. The first thing they say is clinical trials are the primary way to generate actionable evidence informing which vaccines and therapeutics are safe and effective. So it's good to have that recognition in the first instance. And they go on, many therapeutic trials have been inadequate in size, design and conduct, failing to generate the evidence needed for decision making and to drive practice change. In fact, I think they quote uh, a paper which um, Janet Woodcock, uh, who's FDA commissioner, had, was involved in, which was something which it was that uh, uh, something like 95% of all clinical trials in COVID uh, have, have not produced a meaningful or useful result. And indeed, by and large, we're never likely to produce a meaningful uh, or useful result. And then a commitment that by working together as a G7 and with multilateral organizations, for example, the WHO, we will endeavor to implement these principles in our own countries and with partners around the world. So here is, if you like, a mandate for change and one which we should um, uh, respond to and, and point to as we drive for a better future. There was a parallel track uh, led by a clinical pharmacologist called Patrick Valance, a chief, chief scientific officer, which was the 100 days mission. And this actually was part of the leaders track, um, uh, which sets out a number of recommendations uh, in terms of preparation uh, before uh, the next pandemic, remember this one's not over yet, activities uh, for changes to the sort of the rules that we need, um, that we need to get in place before the next pandemic. And then there's this sort of special circumstances that get that swing into action when a pandemic is, is declared. But among those recommendations is, is this one, which is that we must transform the approach to clinical trial regulation. And it's got two elements to this, shortening the time to authorize trials, and streamlining the requirements and guidelines related, relating to trial conduct. And I think it's important 
So think of those two, because very often people think of the clinical trial regulation and the clinical trial approvals as basically a, how do I get through this process quickly? But I think it's also important to think about how can this process be improved so that it drives up quality, drives up the quality of evidence that's produced rather than actually creating restrictions and barriers. And they went on to say, we should refocus regulatory guidelines on the fundamental scientific and ethical principles that underpin randomized trials while embracing flexibility and innovation across a range of health threats and technologies. The GCP guidelines for clinical trials should be revised to focus on what matters for the generation of actionable evidence, rather than what is easy to check but less relevant, and placing an emphasis on principles and purpose rather than process. It's interesting that in the UK context, a, a uh, report, um, I can't remember the full name, but it goes under the sort of uh, code name, is it's the acronym of TIGGER, also highlighted this need to go for principles and in particular, not to try to solve a problem through legislation, which by and large tends to be inflexible and, and to um, make it harder to innovate, but to go th to, to do this uh, through partnership and collaboration. Now, one of my roles, and indeed the reason why I was on a, the number 18 bus uh, heading to the Wellcome Trust on the, uh, in early March uh, last year, um, talking to Jeremy Farrow uh, about the, uh, the desperate need for reliable evidence about COVID treatments, is I've been leading the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative, hosted by Wellcome, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the African Academy of, of Sciences, but really involving a very broad church um, or churches of, of people interested in randomized trials. The steering group, as an example, has observers on it from um, FD, the FDA commissioner, from uh, the EMA, uh, a regulator from uh, Ghana and Africa, the WHO, uh, as well as industry, academic, patient uh, and uh, funder um, uh, participation. But it's in fact involved hundreds of people from around the world in different sectors and with different perspectives. And why do we need to, do, to change what, what, what we're doing? Well, current guidelines focus on how and what. Um, and what we need to do is focus on the why, focus on the principles. Recognize, first of all, that many trials pose little or no additional risk to participants compared to normal clinical practice. So was it uh, more risky to give patients hydroxychloroquine just on a standard prescription or to randomize them into a trial of hydroxychloroquine versus not? Likewise for convalescent plasma and indeed likewise for dexamethasone. And even likewise for many of the other treatments, um, which including some of the newer treatments, um, or even on some of the unlicensed treatments, given what was known. We have to recognize the strengths of the routine healthcare system, particularly in the UK, where there are standards to which both organizations and individuals are held to account. You know, so for example, the General Medical Council, which govern doctors, already includes um, uh, professional standards around accurate note, note keeping, uh, around uh, whistleblowing, uh, ar around um, oversight of junior teams, and so on and so forth. There's no need to repeat all that stuff just because it's a trial. The word trial is not a sufficient reason to add burden. The question is what's, what's actually fundamentally different. And we need to allow trialists to actually determine efficient, effective solutions, saying that, you know, this document must be stored at this site and signed by this person is a mechanistic uh, approach, which may well not be suitable in all circumstances. What one needs to do is, is decide what the principles are and encourage uh, compliance with the principles rather than uh, the, the detail. We need to discourage excessive or defensive practices. Oh, we reported this because we couldn't rule it out. I mean, we see that enormously with uh, relatedness assessment, so Suzar reporting and so on. I couldn't rule out that this, this uh, clinical event wasn't caused by the drug and therefore I reported it, reported it. That's not actually thoughtful or helpful. It's just purely defensive. And documentation is not the same as quality. Um, uh, you, could, you could document, document, document and still do a bad job. Actually, probably trivially, you could have almost no documentation and do a fabulous job. 
So what does good guidance look like? And this is the test we've set ourselves at the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative, but I'd recommend it as guidance you set to yourselves as you develop standard operating procedures or other guidances, or when you look at uh, guidance produced by regulators, whether that's uh, a national regulator uh, or an international collaboration of regulators such as the ICH. So focused on good science and on ethics, focused on the, on the principles of what, of what underpins the trial. Clear and concise, it's easy to write complicated guidance, guidance, it's much harder to write it clearly and concisely. Inclusively developed, regulators, funders, commercial and academic trialists, clinicians, patients, public, and then more besides, actually needs to contribute. Nobody has uh, such widespread knowledge that they know what good guidance should be. One needs the diversity of thinking uh, uh, and contribution in order to produce good guidance for clinical trials. So organizations that only comprise you know, a small club of, let's say, regulators and pharma is not a good way to develop good guidance that actually meets the purposes. It may be well-meaning, it may be um, uh, practical or, 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 um, or, or, or um, uh, sort of uh, operational, but it's not the way to produce good guidance. One needs some, it, it to be inclusively developed. And when you, you know when you've got the principles right, when they stand the test of time. It's easy to regulate and produce guidance for the world gone past, for experience, but it's hard to regulate for the future. And yet that is absolutely necessary to regulate for innovation. It's a little bit like pe putting people in the, uh, uh, together in the age of um, uh, where steam was what was drove, drove uh, the energy source for, for factories and then putting regulations around that and then along comes electricity. Well, electricity require, still achieves the same things. The principles are still the same about protecting the workforce, delivering, delivering a, a reliable supply of energy and so on but the details will be different. So the guidance that we produce must be forward-looking, durable, and allow across all phases of trials, different designs, different geographies, different circumstances, and as innovation occurs, both in terms of treatments and in terms of the way we do trials in the future. So I'm down to my final two slides. Um, this is my conclusion slide. Randomized trials are an essential component of high quality clinical care. We've absolutely seen that during COVID-19. Um, arbitrary use of unproven treatments is damaging to patient care. It's damaging to patient health, to public health. It's actually making a false promise to patients. And, and randomized trials should be seen as part of delivering high quality clinical care. Whatever healthcare organization you work in, Randomized trials are part of what you do in order to try and find it, find uh, better treatments, uh, better health interventions for your future. And what's absolutely clear is that compelling results change practice. Trials need to be designed in a way that they will deliver that change in practice, not ra just rise, raise a series of further and further questions. Now, to be clear, particularly given this audience, I recognize that there are trials earlier in the, in the drug development phase where the aim is actually to inform the practice of how should I, or sh indeed should I, and how should I develop this drug further? And that is the, the decisions that you're going to make, and that's the right way to do it. In the context where one's nearing the patient, one wants trials that will change practice, whether that's a new drug or an old drug or a repurposed drug or a different dosing schedule, it still remains. The trials need to be feasible for patients and clinical staff, inclusive of relevant patient groups and focused on the outcomes that matter. And that's going to require leadership and coordination and collaboration, a sense of fairness and transparency and of, of honesty across all organizations. This is not regulators on one side, um, trialists on the other. This is not industry on one side, the health system on the other. This is not patients on one side and doctors on another. But these lessons are not only important for COVID, but for tackling the huge burden of many other common conditions, which actually uh, uh, are such a challenge in today's world. And final, finally, enormous thanks, of course, to the funders and the organizations that we've worked with, but to over 4,000 doctors and nurses and other healthcare and research staff uh, across, now must be over 200 hospitals, uh, mostly in the NHS, but around the world, uh, 
Uh, they're all named in, in, in our papers, but most particularly to the tens of thousands of patients who participated in what has been the most extraordinary project, the recovery trial. We see so many numbers. I've spoken about numbers, uh, numbers of cases, numbers of deaths and so on. But behind every number is a real person, a real, uh, th their, their family, their relatives, a real story. And sadly, for co in COVID, so many of those stories have been tragic. And that's why we do this work, so that patients tomorrow are treated better than the patients uh, yesterday. Thank you very much.